I want them to be saved through that preaching. That's why you are preaching the gospel. And it must be persuasive preaching. Chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with the excellency of speech. Think about that. I came to you not with the excellency of speech. I'm sure you heard when I said, I think that was on Friday. That all the Greek and all the Hebrew and all the Latin, all the ancient languages, we don't need, you can do that in your study. But we are presenting the gospel to the ordinary people, to the, you know, people like me, people like us. And you then say this is the Greek and this is the Hebrew and this is the Latin. And then you are trying to, you know, bring all that you have studied and all those big, big books. It's like when a patient goes to a doctor and the patient says, here is, you know, I have a headache, I have a stomach problem here, and I need some prescription. Then you go into all your medical books and, every, um, and you bring out all those words and, it, and the man said, I was sick, but now I'm confused. You know, you've increased my problem. I don't, I don't want all those things. All I need, give me the medication and let me go. Just tell me, swallow this one, two times a day and you'll be all right. And then you can keep all those uh, vocabularies to yourself. Because you see, what you want to do is to get people to come to know the Lord. Am I right? You know, if I were to tell you all the things I know, you know, the, I've studied a little too. But you know, if I were to come here and just tell you all those things, I just tell you where I've gone, where I've been, what I've read, what I've studied, and everything. And then so this man is, you know, it will exalt me. It will not exalt Christ. You want to lift up Christ. And Jesus said, and when I'm lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. The danger also is that, you know, some of us, uh, when, when your pastor is, you know, blowing Greek and Hebrew, when you want to go and preach to people at, you know, in your neighborhood, you know, you do just like, you know, like master, like, uh, like follower. Then you begin to blow Greek and say, which church do you go? And then, say, and then it just exalts your church. Let, let's stay at the normal scene and preach Christ. Is that all right? And then present that Christ to people in such a way that people will understand. And then they'll be able to take a decision. What's the decision? I was a sinner. If you can tell a sinner and so preach the word, you don't have to use big, big words for him to understand I am a sinner. That's great. And then I cannot save myself. If he comes to that conclusion, by the deeds of the law, the works of the law, shall no man be justified in the sight of the Lord. If he can come to the conclusion, I am a sinner, I cannot save myself, and that salvation is only in Christ. If he can come to that conclusion and then say that time of salvation is now, I'm going to take a decision, that's all you need. That's all you need. And if we can do that and bring souls into the kingdom of God, we have done what the Lord expects us to do. We're going to do that in Jesus' name. And let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians, we're looking at chapter 15, and I'm reading from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Do you see that? That's the gospel. Paul the Apostle said, this is all you need to know. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And then it says, and that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Present that. Now, in the presentation of the gospel, what do you need? Number one, a convincing presentation. And if you're going to give somebody some, something that is convincing, it must be logical. It must be well structured. There is an introduction. There is a body of what you are saying. And then there is a conclusion. And the fellow says, I'm convinced. But that's not, that's not all. Number two, it must be corrective presentation. Corrective presentation. What I mean by that is, you know, many people, they've come from various backgrounds. The Jehovah's Witnesses are there. They have their own concept about the way of salvation. 
The Mormons are there. They have their own understanding about the way of salvation. And then the traditional religionists are there. They have their own understanding of the way of salvation. There must be corrective presentation that without attacking anybody and without uh, saying that this is stronger, that is stronger, and this whole denomination or whatever is going to hell, it just, you know, while you are building up what you are building up, you correct the errors, you correct the false ideas and opinions that the people have. Number one, convincing presentation. Number two, corrected presentation. Number three, convicting presentation. There's a difference between you being convicted and you being convinced. That means, you know, the fellow now really says, I'm lost. I'm a sinner. If I remain like this and I die in this condition, there's no hope for me. When it comes to that situation that is convicted, that's something that, you know, the Lord can work on. Number three, a compelling presentation. Not just that I'm convinced, I'm convicted, I'll think about it. I'll try and do something. I'm compelled, compelled then to come in. That he just says, he says, what can I do? I just need to get out of this bondage of sin, out of this condemnation, out of this evil. I need to get saved now. And that's what happened to the Philippian jailer. He took the lamp, he came out, and then he said, Sirs, Paul and Silas, what shall I do to be saved? The presentation has a kind of a compelled him. Number five, Christ centered presentation. Not church. Not me, not you. You know, I'm a Christian. I'm this, I'm that. I don't do this, I don't do that. Maybe there's a place for that sometimes. But you know, that's not the gospel. Not you, it's Christ. I don't want to know anything among you except Christ and Him crucified. The message must be Christ centered. And then number six is a converting presentation. If they are not converted, we have almost wasted our time. Maybe it's not a total waste, but they come to an awareness that they need Christ. They need something. But they must go beyond awareness, and they must really have the possession of what Christ has given us. Number seven, complete, clear, comprehensive presentation. It's complete. That means uh, you talk about sin, that's not complete. Then you talk about the Savior. And then you talk about the sinner, what he can do now. You've talked about the sin. You've talked about the lot of the sinner if he does not repent. You've talked about the provision of Christ, the Savior. And then you brought everything together by grace. Are you saved through faith? And now everything is complete. And you can take a final decision. Now I know what you do. And then you don't say, okay, go, go back home and think about it. We can do that now. Now is the time of salvation. And the Lord will save the people. And you know if our preachers, our pastors, every Sunday you come to church and realize there are sinners there. There are people that need to know Christ there. And whatever we're preaching, whatever the topic, whatever the subject, we still deal with salvation one way or the other. And the person that is teaching us the scripture, whatever we're teaching that day, we still find a way of presenting in a very brief way, convincing manner, the way of salvation, that people will have a chance to know the Lord. They will not be coming to the church for many months and many years, knowing the doctrines of the Bible, and yet not knowing what it takes to be born again, which they could have known in 10 minutes. Let's present the gospel. The Lord will have mercy on us in Jesus' name. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, Acts chapter 14, we're looking at verse 1. Acts chapter 14, verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that the saints, that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake. Notice that little word there, so. And so spake. That means they spoke in such a way, in such a manner, at, at a very great level, that they so speak that a great multitude of the Jews and also of the Greeks believed. That's what we need. They so spoke that a great company, a great number of the Jews and of the Gentiles believed. That's what we need to do. That's what we're going to do. And then he tells us in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verses 2 and 3. 
And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Reasoned with them, reasoned with them out of the scriptures. What well, the result of that? Look at verse 3. Opening and alleging that Christ must need have suffered and risen again from the dead. And that this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. The presentation of the gospel. You know, Paul could have spoken about quite a lot of things because that man, he was uh, you know, highly educated in the early church. All the other disciples and apostles, you know, one was a tax collector, he was a tax collector. The other, you know, the others were fishermen and the other people just, you know, they run of the meal kind of people, ordinary people like you and I. But Paul, the apostle, that man had a depth of knowledge. That even the unbelievers say to him, if you could, would be able to compete with him, but not very many. But when he came to present the gospel, it was just the gospel. He told them about Christ who died, about Christ who was buried, about Christ who rose again for justification. And there was it. Was, what was the result? Verse 4. And some of them believed. And that's what you're looking for. For the people to believe when you preach. For them to come to Christ to know the Lord. As the Lord and personal Savior. And he consulted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. And of the chief women, not a few. The people that believe. That's the result we're looking for. That's the result we're going to get. We're looking at it now. Number three, purposeful planning for a great harvest. Purposeful planning for a great harvest. Now the area of planning is where the church, I mean the church in general, where the church in general had failed. Not just this church. Maybe we planned a little. But many of us don't know anything about planning. And we need to plan. Isn't evangelization the work of God? Isn't it Christ who saves and isn't the word of God just there for everybody? Why do we need planning? Because as you look at your Bible, you are going to see a lot of planning. God is a great planner. Have you studied the creation and see the plan of God from the first day, the second day, the third day? He could have done everything in one single day, but he planned everything out. And you see how he worked out everything before he created man, the, the crown of creation? Not only that, look at the deliverance and redemption of the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. And see what he said. He gave a promise and then he called Moses. And then as he laid everything out, you see the planning. And look at the possession of the land of Canaan as Joshua went in. And then they went to this and that and that. We don't have time to go through now. A lot of planning. And look at, the, at David, that great king, a great and mighty warrior. What would you say the difference between Samson and David? Samson, you know, had great power. But he didn't have any army. And he fought all his battles alone. He was a great man of great strength. No planning. But if you look at David, he had, you know, the captain. He had the, you know, the, the first touchy, that Those valiant men. And then he had other people in the subordinate. And then he stretched out all the, I mean, there are thousands. You see, real organization and planning. Now come to the New Testament. We're talking about planning. So that we can do real evangelization. Let's look at Christ. In, in Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 35, Mark chapter 1 verse 35, and in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and he, he, he departed into a solitary place and there prayed, that we all know and that we all do perhaps. And Simon in verse 36, and they that were with him followed after him. And they that had, and when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. That alone. All men seek for thee. But you know you need planning. If you're going to reach the whole world, you cannot stay in one city and say there's a law, a large crowd here in this one city. In this single locality, all men are seeking for thee. And then just say, we're going to build the biggest tent in the world here. How about the rest of the world? Look at verse 38. And he said unto them, let us go into the next towns. We'll do number one. We must go to number two. 
Number three is there. And they all need the light of the gospel. And they all need the sweetness of the gospel, the salt. Everybody needs it. Therefore, plan that we go to the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. Now, after Jesus Christ had done that, do you know the next thing he did? Look at chapter 3, verse 14. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. And Jesus was a great preacher, and a savior as well, and a great healer, and a great redeemer. But then he said, I'm not going to do everything all by myself. And those of us who are pastors here, do we develop other people? Do we delegate any part of the work to others? And when you have mastered an area of work, do you drop it and say, you go with that, you can do that? But you know, sometimes we load ourselves with quite a lot of things. Because I can do this, I can do this, I can do that. You don't do everything you can do. You have to train other people. That's part of the plan. And we're told that Jesus Christ selected the twelve. And then he, he said they'll be with him. They will be with him. Why? So they can observe him. So they can learn by observation. And then he will send them forth to preach. In that same chapter 6, uh, sorry, chapter 6 now, in Mark chapter 6, we're looking at verse 7. Chapter 6, verse 7, and he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth. He called unto them the twelve, and began to send them forth. Do you see some plan here? Originally, in chapter 1, he did it all alone by himself. And then they said, all the people are looking for you. He said, let's go to the next town. So I must preach there also. Then in chapter 3, he got all these 12 together to train them, to equip them, to form them, to develop them. And then in chapter 6, now he sent them out in verse 7, two by two. And he began to send them for two by two. And he gave them power over unclean spirits. Look at verse 12. And they went out and preached that men should repent. They actually did it. They went out and they preached that men should repent. Are you happy to be the minister, the pastor, the preacher, do it all, know it all? And nobody can do anything if you are not there. We're not going to win the world that way. It's going to take more than one preacher to even reach this city in which we are. And it's going to take more than one preacher to reach any of the cities where you come from. Train other people. Develop other people. Let them make their mistakes. And then you correct them. And then we come to Versace. Chapter 6, verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. That leaves room for supervision. Supervision. They came back. They reported back to Christ, this is what we have done. This is what we have taught. And that's part of the planning. And now let's, say, let's look at chapter, Luke chapter 10, verse 1. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. And after these things, the Lord appointed all the seventy also. He must have been looking at the field. He must have been seeing that we need more. We need more workers. We need more leaders. We need more evangelists. We need more preachers. That's why now he gave us these 70. And the Lord has told us what to do. As you look at uh, Luke chapter 24. Luke